Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. It is the Lord's Day. It's Sunday. So I'm feeling holy. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that is two podcasts in a row that you've I know. Like, been a church vibe. I think you're a church goer now. We can't keep recording on Sundays because the spirit's with me on those days. <laughs> That's your joke that you're <laughs> wanting. <laughs> you watch Secret Chase Life of that. Mormon Wives once and you become a Mormon again. <laughs> I know. It's so weird. It really got me. <laughs> <laughs> what wine are you drinking? Um, A Josh Rosé. It's actually mm, very yeah. beautiful. I have a serious problem actually lately where I have a bunch of red wine and never the wines that I'm actually drinking. Like my champagne is always out of stock or low. My rosé is always out of stock or low. And my Chardonnay right now, I have no Chardonnay. Mm, And like, I can't understand what's happening to me. I think it's because I just genuinely love those ones so much. I can drink them anytime that I drink them too fast. Maybe. I don't know. It's really a problem. Well, here's my problem. I have so much wine. It's not even funny. Like I have so much wine that I am just like, wow, I really don't drink when I'm by myself. And I don't know why, because I literally, I think I counted my red wine the other day and I think I have 21 bottles of red wine. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. That's like it's, it's insanity. And I've got to like, I've got it's to figure so it out. It's crazy to me, like that you don't enjoy just like, like when I was at your house on your birthday, getting a glass of wine and sitting on your back porch with like the crisp air. Like I would do that every night to just decompress and like, God, I can just feel it right now. Like, I can't believe that doesn't like soothe your soul. I mean, alcohol doesn't work that way for me. Like it doesn't relax me. It makes me like kind of hyped up, like party (laughs) type vibe. Yeah. So like, it doesn't relax me. Like I will smoke on my backyard or a bit on my back porch, but I don't ever like drink back there unless I'm with friends. I think for me, it really comes down to the taste of wine. Like I genuinely enjoy the different experience of different tastes, like the different wines will bring me. Like, I'm always so curious to know, like, how's this one going to taste? Like I crave knowing what it's going to taste. Like I see them sitting on my shelf and I'm like, I haven't had this one. I wonder what it's going to taste like. And then I think like, what night's going to be best for me to like have this experience? It's like a whole experience yeah. for me. <laughs> and I love that I had experience your porch, too. <laughs> I love that experience too, but I, I love it with friends. But it has been fun having a wine subscription again because we do get like a lot of really different wines that we wouldn't normally get. Tony doesn't drink wine with you? No, not unless like there's friends there (laughs) how weird maybe you just aren't offering maybe he's just sitting here like wow I can't drink her wine like I can't drink it unless she's ready to drink it and like she only opens it up when the friends are here no because this was an (laughs) annoyance of me I made that reel last week of our wine subscription box you know Mm -hmm. and I had to open up a bottle to like pour the reel and I was like okay I'm opening up this bottle like we have to drink it today like this is a nice wine blah blah blah. I had him pick the bottle he literally had a glass and a half out of it and I was like I'm not drinking this whole bottle by myself on a Sunday like I have to work tomorrow and he why literally... don't you just save a glass for Monday night after work and like sitting on your back porch I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't have to be drank in the same day. Because I feel like it tastes weird the next day. What? I don't know. Girl. Girl. I know. It's it's an annoyance. Like, he literally you, hardly drank anything. You need to go to another wine class on the cruise that we're going on to really learn some more lessons. I I'm know. Disappointed. I know. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, wine does sound really good right now. Maybe I'll open up a bottle for tonight, but... No. I don't know. I just I'm a wino. I always have been and I'm not sad about it. Mm, there's nothing wrong with it. I My mean I wish I was probably sad about it. To be honest. <laughs> I wish I drank more because I spend a lot of money on wine and I don't fucking drink it. I have so much wine in my pantry, it's not even funny. Well, just remind me to start coming to your house and I just won't bring any 
and yeah. then I'll help make sure that you get rid of your stock. Seriously, come over <laughs> anytime because I have, and it is getting red wine season. So I'm excited I to know. crack open some of those red wines. That's actually been a problem for me. I actually just told my friend the other day, I was like, I'm having a serious problem where red wine seasons happened and I'm drinking so much red wine. Like I can't drink wine every single night. Like it's just not normally what I do. And so I've noticed like if I do it every night, I'm like, damn, like, this is not good for my health. Like I'm trying to lose weight. And then I was like, but it's so hard because red wine in the fall, like so something, something about it is just different. Mm -hmm. I totally it's, agree. It's so, I don't know. It's and beautiful. it's getting to be pomegranate seeds and champagne season too. And I'm very excited about that. Did you realize that we barely did that last winter? I know. I feel like last year was like a weird year. Like we didn't do Winter normal was things. Strange. Yeah, the whole year for me was off. Um, I think also pomegranates were expensive and we were lazy. <laughs> it's because <laughs> both of our husbands are like, don't buy the ones that are already opened and all the things for you. I'll open up your pomegranate. So and then, then we, we never buy, do. Yep. So then we buy full pomegranates, two for four dollars at Smith's, and nobody ever opens them. And I don't want to open them. I will buy the already open palms. Like for seven bucks, I'll do it. Yep. Same. Because go oh, to Costco, I'll open you can it get for two. you. No, you don't open it for me ever. Yeah. And like also when I'm in the mood for champagne, like I don't want to be like, can you open my pomegranate? Like, no. <laughs> Make a huge it's... giant mess that I yeah. have to clean up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, I feel you. I think that's why I think we were just boycotting. Maybe. Um, <laughs> but who really other... suffered? Not them, us. <laughs> other than my wine addiction, I haven't really been up to much, I feel like, the last week. Um, yeah, my week. Oh, I was sick. So I finally got over my sickness. And that's been nice. But also, I realized that maybe I am in an ignorant funk right now. Like, I just don't care to deal with anything in life. Like, I'm, no I noticed this this weekend where, like, I don't care to respond to messages on my phone. I don't care to, like, do anything with anybody. I'm just kind of like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I mean, I feel the same, kind of. I feel like we just had a really wild summer, like, it's like every single weekend, week, everything was something. And I feel like I'm just kind of like in this rest phase. Like I just kind of want to rest. I just don't want to talk to people. Yeah. <laughs> As I'm on a podcast, but like, no, I don't want to like entertain them. I don't want to like, I don't know. I'm in like an antisocial stage, I think I would say, where like sometimes I'll get like this little glimmer of like, Oh, it'd be really fun to do like something this, or maybe I should invite someone over to like sit in the hot tub and have wine on the porch. And then I'm like, yeah, fuck that. Like, no, I'll do it by myself. I want to just be by myself. <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, actually though, I was thinking today in my hot tub, if you lived nearby, like actually you're, you're my exception. You're my only, <laughs> you're always my only exception. Well, I'm honored. I'm honored about that. <laughs> but maybe you know, that would change once you lived here. I don't know. Like maybe it's the distance that makes my heart grow fonder. Stop coming over to my house, please. <laughs> you don't live here. <laughs> you know that, right? Even though right now you part-time live here. <laughs> oh, <geez. sighs> Well, I just got back from a silent retreat. So it's funny that you brought all that up because... Yeah. It was so wild. Okay, so I'm going to share about my experience because it actually was like a really good experience. It was something that I needed to happen, but I am not the type of person that likes to be alone, not talking to people. It was very, very difficult for me, but I learned a lot. So um, okay, before you dive into it, can you like structure a little bit of like what the rules were? Yeah. A, a how you got into it and then like what the rules and vibes were because I think that people probably don't understand fully sometimes like what goes into these things. Yes. So I got into it. Um, a girl that used to teach at the yoga studio, she does just like a lot of, she owns a, what's it called? 
drug rehab place up in Cache Valley. And she just does like a lot of like breathwork type events. She does a lot of retreat things. And yeah, so clear back in January, she asked me if I wanted to teach in at this retreat in October. And I was like, oh, sure. Like, that would be great. Let me know the dates. Like I put it in my phone. Didn't really think about it. Honestly, I kind of forgot about it. If I'm being completely honest. And then I was doing my calendar. Like I always kind of had it in my mind because I was in like the Facebook group for it. And every now and then she would like post something like, oh, six months away or five months away. Like, you know, so then I was doing my calendar for October, like because I have a calendar like on my fridge and I was filling that out. And I was like, oh, my God, this silent retreat. Like, what the heck? Again, didn't really like think much about it. I was just kind of like, okay, like, yeah, I'm doing this like you know, I need to prep this, this, and this, like whatever. And even Tony was like, oh my gosh, I forgot you were teaching at that retreat. Like you committed to that a long time ago. And I was like, yeah, like, I'm not sure if I really want to do it, but like I committed so long ago, like I can't back out, you know, but I was like, okay, whatever. Okay. Last Sunday. So Monday last week, it was like the week before I left on Thursday. I was just in like the biggest funk. So I bring this up because it's funny how when you do something that's like really good for you in like the metaphysical slash spiritual world, your body and your- don't want to do it. Yeah. And your body and your brain kind of knows that you're doing it and it's prepping you for it. I feel like you hear that before like ayahuasca or before ketamine treatments, people will be like, oh, I'm having like these dreams and blah, blah, blah. Like I feel like the other side's just kind of trying to like prep you for it. So on Monday, I just was like, I did not want, I was kind of like how you are. Like, I didn't want people to talk to me. I didn't want to be around people. Like, I just kind of wanted to be by myself and just, I wanted like quiet. I know I've mentioned a ton before, like I'm a big TV watcher. I love TV. I didn't even want to watch TV. Like, I just wanted things like silent and just like chill and relaxing. So I was getting super irritated because work has been so busy, like way busier than we've ever been before. And it's like, even on the days that I'm not seeing patients, I'm still seeing patients because we're so busy, but like, I don't even have time to do what I need to do because the girls are behind and I have to step in and help with patients, which is fine. I'm happy to do it, but like, it's just been so busy, you know? So anyways, I just like was kind of off all week, just want to quiet, like food wasn't tasting good to me. And I was like, do I have COVID? Like, am I going to actually get out of this retreat because I have COVID? Like food just tasted kind of like cardboard. Like it just didn't taste good to me. So anyways, it didn't really hit me until Wednesday night and I like needed to pack. And I was like, wait, remember when you had COVID and everything smelled like trash? (laughs) Yes, that was worst the worst side effect of COVID ever sometimes I still get random smells of garbage like how people say like (laughs) when you have COVID like sometimes your symptoms last for a while like I'll occasionally be like it was like garbage in here it's the worst that was when you said cardboard I was like yeah it checks out that you might have COVID (laughs) (laughs) sorry I couldn't continue okay (laughs) okay so on Wednesday I got like the email of like the stuff to pack in the rules and stuff and then it like all hit me I was like oh my god like what am I doing I do not want to do this like there was not one part of me that wanted to do this And so the rules were, there was no speaking at all. The only time I was able to speak was when I was teaching yoga. And even then, like my speech had to be minimal. Like it couldn't, I couldn't like use, I don't know, because sometimes like I'll talk during classes. I couldn't, like I could just like say how to get in the pose and that was it. So no speaking at all to anybody or anything. There was no music, um, no phones. You would have to put your phone in a safe when you got there. And yeah, you could bring books to read. You could bring like journal, a journal. And we had like activities every day. Like we had like a painting activity. We made like little mandala rock things. Um, We had like a breathwork journey and a bunch of things. Like we had a bunch of things to do throughout the day, but also like a shit ton of free time. And I was Question. like, mm-hmm. could, did you have your own room? Um, no, you didn't have your own room. You just share with somebody. Yeah. So I was kind of in like the staff room. So I was with like a foot zoner. I was with the chef, with the chef's assistant. And that was just us four in the room. But like the other people were like in like, 
Yeah, bunked up like eight people in a room. So what about bathrooms? You had to share bathrooms with that. Like how, like what's that vibe? Yeah. So you shared bathrooms. So it was actually, so there's a house up in Smithfield up in Cache Valley that was built for like retreats. So there was like six bathrooms, I think. And like okay. rooms, it's like, it was like built for like retreats and like family reunion type vibes. So there's a ton of bathrooms, a ton of beds. Like it was huge. It was a beautiful house. So like, I wasn't worried. I was worried about that on Wednesday, but when I got there, I was like, oh, we have plenty of bathrooms. Like everything's okay. fine. Okay. Next question. When you're alone, are you able to like talk out loud or you have to just be silent? Like what, mm -hmm. like, what's that like? Silent. Completely okay. silent. Yeah. So you can't speak. You Even if you're alone, you can't speak or sing or do anything to like calm the silence. Nope. Okay. Silent. I yeah. just wanted to like understand all fully. Okay, yeah. Continue. And this was all organic food, like no sugar food, um, all organic, which is good. Like, okay, I'll get into the food in a minute. But yeah, so it was just like very different than what I am used to. Very different. And then it kind of hit me. I was like, how the hell am I going to teach yoga? Like, I rely a lot on playlists to like not only fill time, but it also helps me as a teacher, like know where I'm at in the flow, like how much time I have. And like, I don't know, like it, music provokes a certain emotion, you know? So I couldn't do that. And that all hit me on Wednesday. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is going to be really difficult. Like, I do not want to do this. I was so stressed. And I was just telling Tony, like, how can I get out of this? And he's like, you cannot get out of this a day before. Like, you cannot do that. That will look so bad on you. He's like, you're going to be fine. And I was just like, I just don't want to do this. And I was already leaving pre all of this. This was like months ago that I found out my sister was coming into town. So I was already leaving like a day, like a half a day early. So Tony's like, you're already leaving early. Like you're fine. You will make it through this. And I was just like, I don't want to do this. So anyways, I left at the last possible moment that I could on Saturday or on Thursday. I had to be there by three o'clock. I literally left my house at like 140. I did not want to go at all. It was really great. It was really hard. Very difficult. The whole concept of living with people and not knowing anything about them, because the only I knew one person because one of the people there is my friend. And, um, she does like a lot of breath work stuff in the Valley. So I knew one person. So I was like, okay, like I at least know somebody besides like the person running it, but we only knew the names of people and like what their intention was. That was all the talking we got. We didn't do like a weird, like introduction, like, this is what I like, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, your intention and your name. So I'm living with these people and I know nothing about them. Like that whole concept was really, really fucking weird to me. Why is that weird to you? I feel like living with people is such an intimate thing. Like, I feel like that's just, I don't know why. I feel like that's a very, very intimate thing. And like to not know anything about the person, it feels strange to me. That's so silly to me. Like, you feel like you need <laughs> to know like their favorite color and like about them. No, before I feel like just like know something them. about them. Like, because you're sleeping with these people, you're changing in the same vicinity as these people you're showering in the same vicinity as these people like you're doing all these things daily like your regular everyday things brushing your teeth washing your face taking a shower waking up like you're doing all these regular everyday things with people that you don't know is weird to me it sounds like a dream experience for me I would love <laughs> nothing more than to be able to go do something like this and not have to get to know somebody not have to small talk with them not have to know shit about them like I don't look at people when I'm running when I'm going running errands when I'm walking down the street like I want to know nothing I don't give a fuck about anyone around me I'm just in my zone and it sounds like heaven to be able to just be allowed to do that without being an asshole I just think it was so weird <laughs> it was so weird to me so yeah, that was, um, that was kind of the setup about it. That was kind of the rules. Like there weren't a ton of rules, but the rules I felt like were really hard. Like it was really hard for me. Yeah. Um, cause I'm always like listening to something. Like I always am like listening to a, a book or a podcast or music. Like it was really hard to just be in silence. So anyways, I had a few really big things happen. That was really cool. And I, 
the first thing was um, Friday morning, I was like sitting out on the porch because we woke up. We also got woken up at 545 every morning. I don't wake up early. I'm not a no, morning person. I don't enjoy it. Like, I don't like it. I like to just kind of wake up on my own time. And even on the times that I wake up on my own time, it's like I'm a solid like eight to 830 type person. I don't like to wake up early. So that whole thing was weird to me to be woken up with sound bowls in the dark, like, and have to like get up and get moving. Cause like we had meditation at seven o'clock. So it's like, we had like an hour to like, get ready, get tea. They didn't have coffee, like get tea, get like our body moving. And then when like, we did a meditation. So anyways, Friday morning after like the meditation and stuff, I went out on the porch and I was like, okay, I was going a little stir crazy. Like at this point it had been like, not even 12, it'd been 12 hours, like 12 ish, 12 to 15 hours. And I was already like, okay, this is really hard for me. So I like did a little workout out on the porch and then I like got my journal and I was like, Hey, like I can, you know, start journaling, did like my 10 things, did some gratitude, did some like stuff that we did the night before, like, and then I started. So then like I pulled my cards cause I brought tarot cards and one of the cards that I pulled, it was an Oracle card and it said, you need to allow space for grief. And I was like, okay, like, okay, like that's weird. I'm fine. You know, and I'm just journaling. And all of a sudden I started just writing a letter to my dad. Like it was so weird. Like it was something that I didn't even think about. And I was just like, have you heard of morning pages? Mm -hmm. So I was trying to do that. If you don't know what morning pages is, it's when you wake up in the morning and you just like start writing and just like whatever comes out, comes out. I've never done morning pages before. It's always been like an intriguing idea to me, but I was so freaking bored and getting stir crazy already that I was like, I'm just going to try this, like just start writing stuff down. It started coming out as a letter to my dad, which I was not expecting any of this at all. Like I was expecting to go and like work through some like self-esteem issues I've been having to work through like the issues of my leg. Like I was not expecting anything about grief to come up whatsoever. And so I started writing this letter, which my therapist has been telling me to do for probably seven to eight months. And I just have been like, I don't want to, like, I have nothing to say to him. Like, I just don't want I'd to also like to say that I've told you to do this a million <laughs> yes. fucking times, yes. but apparently my therapy doesn't matter. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody's you therapy when about ready. it mattered because I just felt like I didn't have anything to say. Yeah. I wrote almost seven pages of a letter and it was yeah. so like, I, I don't, I don't even know. Like, I don't was know what like the words are. Words? was it a mix of angry Some, it was like a mix of angry a mix of sympathy for him and what like I don't want to cry so I'm not gonna go into like a ton of detail but it was like a mix of anger a mix of sympathy for him a mix of me realizing what I had done which this whole time I've been like I was fine like I was just reacting in a way that anyone would react with what I've been through with him and then I was like as I was writing I was like actually I was an asshole with this and I'm sorry like so it was part of like an apology. Like it was so many things in one thing that it was just like, okay, like what the heck? And so then I was like Dang. sobbing, like yeah. sobbing. So I like put my journal down and I was in like the back and I went into the front and just like laid in the grass and just cried. Like probably for Dang. like, I would say like 40 minutes, maybe like I was just wow. like, like crying the whole sobbing. time. Yeah. Like I just, it was Good. just like, it just kept coming and then like it would stop. And then it, like another wave would come again. And I was just like, what the heck? Like, that's so weird. So then like I go inside and it was time for the art activity. And I'm just like sitting at the table and the owner of the thing, her name's Lauren. She came over to me and she like had a pad of paper and she like, <laughs> showed me and it's like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah. Like I just nodded like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. You know? And she gave me a hug and she was like, and like rubbed my back for a minute. And I was like, okay, like that was really nice, you know? And so then we did, and then I was like, okay, the rest of the day. And I taught a really good yoga class. Like one of the best yoga classes I think I've ever taught, which was so weird because it was so hard to teach in silence. Yeah. Truly. It was so hard. And then that night we had a breath work journey that was two hours long. And yeah, it was, I've never done breath work that long. The max I've done is like 45, 50 minutes. It was truly the most incredible thing I have ever 
done. <laughs> like I felt like I was on some sort of a psychedelic to be completely honest. And it was like, and this was allowed to have music and the music, the sound, like the songs were so perfect for what I was feeling. It was all about grief. Like it was all about grief, which was so weird that like that tarot card that I pulled in the morning said that. So I mm-hmm. sat up like during the breath work and I literally like held my leg in my hand and I was like, please tell me what you need to heal. Like, please something like I need something to know. And it was like, it felt like ocean waves of grief were like just coming over me. It was like my dad, it was my dog dying. It was freaking my sisters and me growing up. Like it was not having enough time. Like I feel like life goes so fast. It was grief with my first boyfriend. Like it was all of these things that were just like, it just kept coming. And it was like coming from like the depths of, you know, when like you have such a deep cry and it feels like it is just like coming from like deep within you. And you're just like, like hyperventilating, sobbing, but I was like doing breath work with it. And it just felt like I was like throwing up, but I wasn't really throwing up. It felt like I was just like throwing up this pain, like I don't even know how to explain it. And that's why I say like, it felt like a psychedelic because in one of my ketamine treatments, my body was telling me like, you need to, you need to throw up, you need to throw up. And I was like trying to fight it. I think I've shared that story, but Mm -hmm. that's, that's exactly what this felt like. Like I was throwing up this pain because it was like, my body was like convulsing as I was crying. And like, it felt just like stuff was like rolling out of me. So weird. It was so strange. And it was so intense. And then we got like done with the breath work. And I was like, what the fuck just happened? Like when I came (laughs) out of it and there was this like bookshelf that was to the side of this house and it was like full of books. And like right in the center, I saw the twilight book and I was like, oh my God, like I need to just read like a palate cleanser. And I love twilight so much. And I was like, what a blessing. Like, I love that I get to read Twilight right now. So I grabbed Twilight out and I like read it until like 1230, one o'clock in the morning. And it was just like, I don't know, like it felt just so comforting and like a warm blanket after that experience. So yeah. And then I left the next morning, taught like a really, why taught like a really beautiful yoga classes that morning on Saturday morning. And like, we watched the sunrise come up and I just like had this thought like in the middle of it like let's just stare out because there were these big beautiful windows and I was like let's just stare out the window and just like be thankful for fucking being alive like so like yeah we did that like I just led the class into that and it was like such a powerful thing for all of these people to be like feeling that same thing I guess like it felt like such mm-hmm. a connective energy feeling like this gratitude for being alive I don't even know and so then I left and it was I was so happy to get home, like truly so happy. I wasn't even sad that I left early. Like I just felt so happy to be home and to have music and to just like, I don't know, I felt like a hundred pounds is like lifted off of me. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was my experience. It was really nuts. (laughs) Wow. That was crazy. I was going to ask like if after all of that, if you were sad to leave, but it sounds like no, Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know what would have happened if you would have stayed another day though, for sure. I was curious about that for like a minute, but I feel like that was what I needed to happen. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I think felt it like... almost would have been too much for you yes. at once. Yes. Like just cause you going into it, you were for sure freaking out like mm-hmm. about the whole silent thing and it's so out of the norm for you. So I think like in small doses, that was like for sure the right call. Yeah. I feel like that was exactly what I needed to happen. I have no, like, I wish I could have stayed another night. I have none of that. I feel like I had achieved what I needed to achieve. I feel so much better. Like, I feel like literally I've let go of things that I was holding on to so hard Mm -hmm. and none of this, like I never went in with the intention of ever doing any of this. Like I never thought, I thought I had grieved. I really did. But what I like really came to realize, like as I was reading Twilight, I was kind of like still my brain was just like so activated and going. It kind of just hit me that like I give so much of my time to other people. I never take the time for me. Like I never take that time to like grieve things that happened when I was 16 years old. Like the fact that I was upset and like 
grieving the end of this relationship when it was so long ago goes to show me like this has been a pattern throughout your entire life that the things that really hurt you, you don't take the time to acknowledge. Like you take baby, yeah. baby sections of it, but you don't take the actual time to really acknowledge how hurt it made you and like be just sad about it. I think that's like a thing that most adults for sure go through is like we live so much life and so much beautiful things and hard things and you have to keep going we have to keep persevering and Mm -hmm. rarely do we like once life starts happening and you're so busy all the time rarely do you go back into your childhood years to like really think about certain things that fucked with you like Mm -hmm. that really hurt your feelings or really upset you like I'm sure there's so many people that have had experience with friends growing up that like never actually like grieved the fact that that happened to them and how hard it was and that they had no one there or things with their family like there's so many experiences that I think a lot of us just sweep under the rug because it's like okay like that was really fucked up I don't want to make those decisions or be in spaces like that again and we think that by just acknowledging it and trying to not be in that again that was enough and it truly isn't enough at all yeah yeah (laughs) I totally agree with that. It was a very big eye opener for me. And I feel like still I'm kind of like, and I mean, Lauren said like, you'll have two weeks go by and you'll have something come back to you that like Mm -hmm. connects and makes sense. And I was like, okay, I can definitely see that because I'm still kind of like, okay, like understanding everything that I was feeling and like acknowledging that like it even happened because it's still like, even when I woke up on Saturday, I was like, that was really weird. Like, did it really happen like that? Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was just so weird to have that completely sober. Like I had nothing in my system to have that intense of an experience. I was like, wow, like just with the breath, that's really weird. Yeah. I think that like, like you mentioned something about like, that's not what I thought was going to come up. And I think sometimes that's like the most beautiful thing when like, you don't have an intention where you're like, I'm seeking this. Like, I really want this to happen. Like, when you just kind of go into it of like, let it happen. Like, I think that's more of like how my approach is in a lot of things where it's like, whatever comes to me, I like want it to come when we go on our birthday trip next year. Like that's Mm -hmm. for sure. My stance is kind of like, whatever the universe needs me to like deal with, that's what I want to deal with. Like, I don't want to be like setting this huge intention because I feel like that put like as an Enneagram one, especially like that's so much fucking pressure for me because that tells Mm -hmm. me this one thing you are fucking dealing with and you're healing it and it's happening now. And like, sometimes that's not in my control. Yeah. Yeah, Like that's not in my control. And as a one, like that really fucks with me. So Mm -hmm. I like, I think it's, I think it's great that like you went into it, like not having anything huge, but like kind of thinking maybe this would be it. And then like having this huge sign of like, boom, this is Mm -hmm. what we're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. It was really crazy. I am really happy that I did it, even though it was really, really, really hard for me to actually go. Like I really did not want to. Um, and yeah, last thing that I'll touch on before we move on from the subject, but we all organic food, all like no sugar food, a lot of like vegetables. I have never in my life felt better than I did those two days. Like truly I have got to eat like that more. Um, we had Chick-fil-A yesterday with my family cause I spent time with my family and it was just like the kids love it. And it was, you know, convenient instantly. As soon as I ate it, my pants got so tight. Like I bloated up, my fingers got swollen. Like It was so crazy and I have really just got to eat better. (laughs) Like that was such a huge awakening to me because I truly felt so good, had energy. My body wasn't like achy and yeah, I came home and I was like, holy shit, Tony, like my stomach looks so like flatter. And then the second I ate Chick-fil-A, it was literally like everything. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Honestly, Food is so crucial. I think there's an episode we actually want to record for you guys where it talks about like how food can like impact your mindfulness and like everything else. I can't remember what exactly our topic like title was, but it was like along those lines. I will say like the last thing I want to say too, I almost feel like it's perfect that you knew nothing about these people. You had no connections with them because I think if you had people around you that you knew, there's no way you would have allowed yourself to go through this journey like if I would have been mm-hmm. there Tony would have been there anyone that you even remotely knew to like a deeper level 
you would have done what we always do where we like, we know we're dealing with stuff, but we're not dealing with the super hard stuff because it's so hard to like really expose that vulnerability and deal with it when you're almost, I don't, I don't want to say that we're like entertaining or like being like, I don't feel like I have to entertain you, but it's like, I know that like you're in my space and I want to show up as a certain version of myself because I want to enjoy my time with you rather than like mm-hmm. the shit storm of struggles, you know? So I think that most people try and like bring themselves to that space when they're around people that they kind of know, cause they don't feel fully ready to just be like, yeah, I'm a dumpster fire right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is true. That is true. I am really grateful, like the way that it all played out. But for sure, when I first got there, I was like, what the hell am I doing? I really want to run out of this house right now and not ever come back. Like, my favorite was when, like, <sighs> our, we had a friend text in our group chat and she was like asking you a question. It's like, sorry, Taylor can't come to the phone right now. She's at a silent retreat. And it was like my favorite like, <laughs> thing to say. Like, I think it just was so silly to tell people that. But I don't know it I already said it to you but like a silent retreat is like something I dream about all the time like I've looked into the ones in Arizona like I want to do one of these so bad because I actually genuinely love silence and not speaking to anybody like I remember I was thinking about you going there and like how much you like didn't want to go when Wally and I didn't have kids and he would go to training for like a weekend or a week or whatever and I'd just be home alone by myself the whole weekend complete silence like I didn't speak. I didn't do, I was just sitting like, sure. I was on my phone and stuff here and there, but like the thought of like never having to speak to people and not have noise is like my dreams. Like he would come back and it would take me like two days before I could even like muster up enough energy to like, finally be like, okay, now we have to speak to people. We have to like engage with them when they're in our presence. Like it's really, really weird. It's like something I love. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was hard. It was really hard, but I definitely like need to incorporate quiet more. I think think that's why a lot of people think I'm like this asshole a lot of the times. Like I genuinely don't like speaking. I, I like to listen. I don't mind being around people. Like I was thinking about how you were like talking about coming and going and not being able to like speak in your yoga class and all those things. Like I was thinking, honestly, I could come to your yoga class if I didn't know you and I just Mm -hmm. wanted to come to yoga. I would come to your class. I wouldn't say a single word to the instructor, nobody. I would just do my yoga and I'd leave and I'd have no problem like not having to engage with a single person. Like it's just so funny how like different we truly are sometimes. Yeah, Yeah. it is. It is. It's very, very interesting, but it was a very good experience. I'm really happy that I did it. Honestly, we'll probably do it next year and yeah, definitely going to make some big changes in regards to my TV time, my phone time, my eating choices. It was a very big eye opener that I distract a lot and I, I eat pretty healthy, but I definitely need to change eating habits. Yeah. Well, I love that for you. Thanks for sharing that with us. I've been dying yeah. to fucking know about it. For sure. <laughs> Did you love that when you messaged me on your drive? I literally didn't even respond for like a couple hours. I was like, that's <laughs> so rude of me. I told her to message me the second she got back to her phone and I listened to it and I literally said nothing. This again goes back to show like, unless I really feel ready to speak, I don't fucking want to speak. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was fine. I, it was totally fine. So. <laughs> Yeah. I also have zero, zero ounce of any sort of tan left. It's definitely fall. So if you're watching on YouTube, I'm as white as my wall. So just, we're going to address the ghost in the room. I, my tan is gone. <laughs> gone so. The ghost in the room. Shit, that's funny. <laughs> it's okay. We love you for who you are, but like uh. I did say, Tinted moisturizer could be cool. (laughs) But then I'd have to tint my whole body. My face would be so dark compared to my body. Like I'm a white ass girl. I am a white ass girl. It is interesting. Like the different perspective on our screens, like your chest, everything is super white. I'm a white, white girl. I mean, I feel white. I'm a ginger at heart. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know what's happening. (laughs) All right, everybody. Well, we do have an actual really good topic for you guys. Um, what we wanted to talk about today 
was learning how to embrace your people around you, your circle, your tribe, whatever you want to call them, and learning how to ask for help or just asking for help in general, which is like, I'm literally the most guilty person about asking for help. I want zero help ever. It makes me severely uncomfortable. That's like a whole thing I've had to like explore myself. I have some stuff I'll share about why I'm that way, but I'm sure I'm not alone in that. But um, I think that it's really difficult for a lot of us to find a group of people that you feel like you can lean on and trust and support them and they support you equally. And then also it's equally as hard to ask for help. I truly think like if you can lock in all of those, you have like the trifecta to like the most beautiful life and probably a lot simpler life. <laughs> if you can find all of those things, you know, and like really embrace them and I don't know, learn how to be okay with them. I personally am not there yet, but that's also why I really wanted to talk about it, like the vulnerability with it and just, I don't know, learning to lean on people that you trust. I think that there's so much power in that. And a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people do it and I've also done the same. And so, yeah, that's my biggest reason for wanting to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just think it's a really good topic to talk about. And I think it's something that a lot of people do struggle with, especially in today's times. I feel like people are a lot quicker to judge people. So I think it's just hard to find people that you can trust and then actually trusting people. Like if you do find people you can trust, I think it's hard for you to let go of your walls and let people in. Yeah, for sure. So while we're talking about it, let's just start with asking for help. Like there's this stigma, I think that I don't know if society's put it on us. I don't know if it comes from like traumas or what, but like there's truly a struggle that most people have with asking for help. There's some people I've seen that just ask for a lot of fucking help and they're so comfortable with it. And some do it in a healthy way and some do it in maybe a not so healthy way where it's almost like they just want everyone to do stuff for them. I learned through therapy, like some of the balance there, because there's times when I would just like pick up and take over and do stuff for people thinking like, that's what would help them. And really I was just enabling them to be, con continue to be shitty versions of themselves, honestly, where they just rely on others to do everything for them and make life easy for them. So I think that's something I've had to explore too, where it's like, because I have like an anger towards people that do certain things like that too. I'm almost like, I will never fucking ask for help because I never want to be those types of people where it's like, I'm making someone go out of their way to help me or I, they feel like I could do it myself. And like, how dare I like ask them to help me? I don't know. Like I have like, a, it's, it's a lot for me, honestly, to like, to really break down. But I think my biggest thing comes from, I have a problem, obviously I already admitted asking for help. I don't allow people to help me very often. I don't know how to communicate that I need help and I don't know how to accept it, honestly. Um, what I've learned a little bit and there's still so much more to uncover with it, a big part for me was our parents abandoning us and going and living with our grandparents. And then we became these like kids that people felt bad for. And what can we do to help you? And like, I don't know. I don't know where there's somewhere in my childhood for sure where it was obvious that like there's certain people in town that have a lot of money and certain people in town that are privileged and they have these perfect families. And we were the family that was like broken drug addicts, all of the things. And also like, didn't have as much money. Like we just didn't, we were middle-class and they were for sure fucking loaded. And in a small town, that's a lot because it's very obvious. And so it became really difficult for me to want anyone to give me handouts. That's like how I see help. Help to me equals handout where it's like, I come from nothing and you have to give me something because I'm, I'm not strong enough or I'm not rich enough or whatever. Like there's something around it where I'm just like, it is a handout. So if you ever like offer me help, that to me is like, am I accepting this handout? Like Am I not able to provide this for myself? And luckily, I also turned that into a big drive and motivation thing for me. I think that's why I have like had so much drive and 
wants for like a certain life but it's also like a huge fucking hardship like not being able to like accept help (laughs) so that's where I know my lack of help comes from I don't know if you've ever like explored that but that's where mine is (laughs) I've honestly never explored that in myself I don't feel like do you have a hard time asking for or accepting help Um, it kind of depends. I would say as a general overall average answer, no, I don't think I do. But when it comes to like specific things, I think that I do have a harder time with it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's honestly never been anything that I've really explored. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you've really ever asked me for help to be honest. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I do do things a lot, just like by myself like I, I but it doesn't it's not anything that like I get angry about or like it bothers me I think but like you do uh, get like burnt out and like yeah feel like yeah. the weight, weight is on you because mm-hmm. you're doing it alone I don't yeah. ever really feel like it with like friends or family necessarily it was definitely a problem with Tony like in my marriage with our first marriage when we were first married um, I was doing everything and he was kind of yeah. just like not doing anything, but it's, I mean, we've worked through that, but now it's a very healthy balance. But if like he does slack in something that he usually does, i.e. her yard, which is a problem for me. Oh my God. The yard <laughs> is the bane of my yes. existence. Like I get really frustrated because that is, I'm very traditional in my thinking, I feel like a yard is a man's job. I don't think, and except for like a garden or like planting flowers, like, yes, I feel like women can do that, but like the lawn and sprinklers and like the manly jobs. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. Like that is not my job. I'm really sorry if you disagree with me. If you do, that's fine. I know that I'm like old fashioned in thinking this way, but like, if that's not taken care of, I get real irritated and I'm like, the balance is off. The scales are tipped. Like you're not pulling your weight. I do everything inside. You do everything outside. Like where's the disconnect. So that's where I get kind of frustrated with asking for help. Cause I don't want to tell him like, Hey, you need to do this. I just expect, you know, and it should be done because I know if there's dishes in the sink, they need to be done. Like, I'm not waiting for him to give me a fucking invitation. Like, Hey, are you going to do these? Like, you know what I mean? So that's where I get frustrated. But yeah, I think that that's the only instance I can think of without actually exploring it that like, I get really bothered. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, like I for sure feel like the weight of the world on my shoulders a lot. Like that's something that was very heavy in my topics in therapy is like, I feel like the weight of the world is on me. And if I don't make the world go around for everyone in my circle, like the fucking world crashes and I feel alone in it. And I get, I get resentful. I get like, that's an Enneagram one trait for sure. Like where you get super resentful. Enneagram ones do the most though. I do have to say like, we are our own problem because we Mm -hmm. do do the most. And then we suddenly get this point where we're like oh my god I'm so fucking frustrated like I feel like I do everything and nobody does anything for me but I also don't let them know that I need anything for me you know like I don't Mm -hmm. communicate that I need help or that I need support and I do for sure think that you're not alone because I know I feel the same way about certain things around the house like that and I guarantee most of our listeners probably have the same conversations I am a bit of the more traditional side of that too where it's like the yard is the man I do the cleaning, like sure Mm -hmm. he could pick up his own fucking shoes, but that's not cleaning. Like that's, Mm -hmm. I could pull weed here or there. I could plow flower here and there. Like that's me kind of doing a little bit of it, but like the yard, the schedule, all of that, that's on you. And when it doesn't fucking happen, I get so fucking livid. And it's like this thing inside me where I'm just kind of like, I look outside and I'm like, God, really be real fucking nice. If I had a nice yard right now, like not sure why it's not there. Like you come home and the (laughs) house looks great. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> can't figure out that one but it's fine guys I'm gonna hire a lawn person next year so my problems will be <laughs> solved but you're definitely not alone in that and I think that that's a thing that's hard to communicate or deal with too when it comes to like your spouse or your family or your friends like it's really hard for me to ex- accept help from Wally sometimes or also communicate to him that I need help and support and that's like a thing that I think therapy would help us both with is learning how to like people talk about it all the time and I think it seems so stupid when you like hear them talk about it where it's like on Sundays we meet and we talk about our schedule and we like talk about all these things with kids 100% that's something you should be doing we always say that we will and we don't 
we always wait till the boiling point. And I think we're human in that. I think we're normal in that. That's probably the majority of people's experiences where it's like, you just do, you do, you do. And then suddenly you're like, one of you explodes and it's like this whole thing. And like, it sucks. It gets healthier and healthier through therapy I've noticed, but like, I don't think we're alone in those situations. And I think it's common, but I do think it comes down to when the weight of the world is on your shoulders or when you are going through a hard time, like, how do you go about asking for help? How do you go about sharing that you're struggling? How do you go about all of these different things, feeling alone? Like, I know I feel alone. I don't know if you ever feel alone. Like I have Mm -hmm. a great group of people, but there's still times where I'm like, God, and it's my own fault too, because I like to be alone. But like, there's times where I'm like, God, I feel like no one actually cares about me. And it's not that I actually believe that, but there's a larger thing going on where you can start to be like, okay, I'm doing everything alone. It feels like I'm alone. And the only way that I can make it better is to communicate. The only way I can really deal with it is to ask for help. And sometimes asking for help, in my opinion, makes you seem weak. I don't know if others feel that way. I'm guessing I'm not alone in that. But sometimes like that's what goes through my mind is like, I'm just being a little bitch. Like I don't need to share my struggles. I don't need to share that I'm having a hard time. And also if I do like I'm broken. So I don't know. I don't know how you feel. I don't personally feel like that, but I can hundred percent say that you are not alone because I see this every single day at work every single day, majority of people feel this way, that they feel like an inconvenience. They feel like their feelings are an inconvenience. Their emotions are an inconvenience. Even them pushing the button to ask to go to the bathroom because they can't stand up because they're under medication makes them feel bad and like they're an inconvenience and that I, they're bothering me. Oh, so yeah. I would be that person. I'd be like, I can go to the bathroom yeah, alone. You would, <laughs> you would 100%. <laughs> so you are not alone in thinking that at all. I think a lot of it also goes back to like our generation. I feel like, like Jaden's generation is so different from ours that it was mm-hmm. like, you never asked for help. Like even it was a burden to ask. It your was a for burden. Help. Yes. It was a burden and like mental health. Like if you said, if I said in high school, yeah, I have anxiety, I would be like a freak. Like I would be weird. And people <laughs> would like, be like, oh my God, you have anxiety. That's so weird. And now it's like so normalized to talk about needing help to talk about like, Hey mom, I cannot move out on my own because we're in a recession and things are so expensive. Like, how can we work it out that I can still live with you? You know, like expectation to mm -hmm. have your, I don't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was an expectation where it's like, you have parents with a job, you go to school, you get the career, you go to college, like you move out and you do all these things. It was 100% this like unspoken expectation, I think. Like Mm -hmm. it was just what you were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if it is like a Utah thing. I don't know if other states feel this way, but for me, it was like Tony and I wanted to move out when I was 18, but both of our parents were like, oh, you guys can't do that. Like you guys, you can't live with each other without being married. So we were like, fuck it. We'll get married then. Like if that's what we have to do, we'll get married then. So then we got married and then bought a house a month later had no idea how to pay bills, had no money. And neither one of us could ask any of our parents for help because we were so terrified. Like we have to do this. Our parents didn't want us to do things this way. So we have to prove them wrong and we cannot ask for any sort of help, even though we desperately needed help. I mean, I think that's, what's crazy too, is like research has actually shown like our generation has this weird level of independence and self-sufficiency where it's like over glorified where it's Mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand exactly all the things that went into it, but maybe like as the, our parents' generation was growing up, they were kind of like, oh, we figured things out. We went through this hard time with our parents and now we're going to do this with our kids. And this is the right thing to do. And I think that's kind of like how these cycles happen with these different generations. And for some reason, ours was like, no, like, cause we talk about it a lot on the podcast. We're like, Henley's with me all the time. Like she spends time with me. Kids are always around their parents in like our generation. And that was never the case for ours. And so you start to see like these different patterns already starting to build. Like there's no way Jaden could get married and have a house right now. Like, no, absolutely not. What? Like, yeah, that doesn't even make sense, you know? And so it's, I think it's just really, it's hard because 
sometimes independence and self-sufficiency is something that people crave and want. And sometimes life makes it so that's like a part of your journey. But there's, I think there's a thing with like having too much of it. And I think I'm for sure in that stage where I've always had too much. I think there's plenty of things that go into my why behind that, but I've seen other, like I have a friend, her husband works on like the oil fields and he's gone for two or three weeks at a time. And then he comes home for two or three weeks at a time. She has to be independent. She has to be self-sufficient, but they have luckily like a healthy relationship and balance that when he comes back, like the burden shifts back onto him and he does like more and stuff, but there's plenty of people where like they have these relationships in their life where they carry the most and they never shift that balance. And if you don't shift that, like you're only going to explode. Like, yeah, you just will. <laughs> mm-hmm. And but- it's a really hard habit to break. Like you see so many people around our age that are like, oh yeah, I worked so many hours this week and I only slept for a few hours. And it's like, why are, are we glorifying <laughs> that? Yeah. Like, why are we glorifying that? Sleep is good for your health. Like you need sleep. So why are we glorifying this? Oh yeah. I only slept two hours last night because I was working or I was doing this. Like, I don't I mean, know. I think, I think that's why like burnout is such a huge thing for sure. Right now it's a huge topic that people go through. I for sure know that like I was living on fumes for plenty of years at my old job. And like, it felt fine. Like I actually feel like I wasn't crumbling a lot. I know I crumbled like here and there, but I go through that burnout cycle. Once I went to my new job, I'm now suddenly that like someone needs at least seven hours of sleep. And I used to thrive off of four to five hours. Yeah, you did. I was, I was fine. I was like a crackhead on five hours. I was like, I do better with this amount of sleep, but that's because that was my pattern. And like, I was just constantly running, running and running. And now I'm like at the point where like, if I get less than six hours, I'm unfucking well. And that's been so weird for me to see because I don't know. It's just, I, I lived like 10, 11 years doing this like four or five hours and it was normal. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. what I wanted to like also make sure that we talked about with like asking for help is like one thing I've noticed, especially in my friend groups, I've noticed in my friend groups how many times like I can see friends struggling or my sisters, I can see my friends or my family struggling and we're close. We're so close and they don't feel comfortable sharing, or I can see them like being worse versions of themselves, or I don't know, just kind of spiraling a little bit and they aren't willing to open up about it and share. And like, again, I just went on for like 20 minutes about how I'm literally the most guilty about this, you know, but I do think that I do show up and I do let people know what I'm going through. I just am not willing to let them help me in those moments. But I have noticed a lot with like my family and with some friends that like they can be going through something, but they're not willing to open up and share. And I think that's what like you and I have this relationship where we can be the most open and honest to like the wildest degree And I think that's helpful. I think it's so helpful that we have that space. And I think that there's a lot of people that don't get vulnerable and authentic with what they're going through. And I mean, I think you're dumb because people can see it. First of all, I'll have to say that (laughs) like people, people know that Mm -hmm. you're going through it. And I think it's a disservice to yourself and what you're trying to accomplish. If you can't be open and honest with the people around you, like, I just think it's crucial, honestly. (laughs) Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that your ego really steps in when you are needing help. And I think if you have the idea in your mind that somebody's doing better than you, that you'll be like asking for help or saying what you're struggling with will make them look down upon you. Well, and you'll be less than if you, Mm -hmm. if someone around you that you like, you know, they're like, their, their life seems okay. Like how dare I come in and say that mine is struggling or that I'm going through something like you are the person that's less than in that moment. That's what our ego and our mind teaches us. Like that's just 100% what we go through. And so in those moments, they just choose not to say anything because they don't dare look weak. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think you just kind of have to work on getting over that. So you can open up and say like, just before we started recording, I told Shelby, like, I'm stressed about this fucking cruise and about Christmas and all the money things. Like I need to stop spending money for the next few months. Like, 
that's not money fun is for a me. huge thing that people yes. don't want to talk about either. Like yes. they don't want to share that they're fucking broke. And I will say when, ever since I've known you, we've been very open about our financial mm-hmm. situations. We've always been like, dude, I can't afford to go buy a fucking bottle of Smirnoff right now. Like, what are you talking about? You know, like we were always like, and we would have those conversations. And I think maybe just because we found that safety with each other, there was probably some people in our group that at the time I for sure wouldn't have been like, yeah, I'm fucking struggling paycheck to paycheck. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, low key sometimes still doing that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but like, there's for sure people I wouldn't have been as open with back then, but now anyone in my group, I, I have no problem to be like, yeah, bitch, like shit's fucking tight right now. Like I can't do that. Yeah. But that's yeah. hard. That's a hard thing for people to go through and say and share. And I think that comes down to that vulnerability and auth- authenticity that you need to have with like people around you. Because could you imagine like going through life without being able to share these things. It almost feels like you're living a lie a little bit. Like you're having to yeah. like cover your tracks or something. I don't know. Like it feels very like, I don't know. Yeah. A hundred percent. I couldn't imagine. <laughs> I couldn't imagine, but I mean, I've lived through a lot of my life that I felt like I couldn't share certain parts of me yeah. with people. And I feel like I'm finally to the place that I have a good group of friends. I'm at a good spot with my family. I'm at a good spot with Tony that I don't feel like I have to really hide things or like not share things either. I'm at a really good point with anybody with everybody, or I'm just at the point that I'm like, I don't really care what you guys think. Like, this is how I'm feeling. Take it or leave it. I don't know one or one of the two, but I don't know. Like it definitely takes time and you go through a lot of different people in your life that you don't feel like are authentic and will care about your feelings. I mean, I think that that's also a big criteria I guess I would say for me to invite people into my life is them being vulnerable and authentic and uh, and genuine like those are mm-hmm. have always been things that I've like looked for and expected in a relationship or friends um because I think truly like you go through lows and highs and all of these different things in life and that mm-hmm. builds an actual relationship if you go through these things and they are there for you and they support you and they accept it. I think acceptance is a huge part of it too. Yeah. Like that's what actually builds relationships. And I honestly, like if I start to notice that people aren't being vulnerable or authentic or genuine, like I for sure start to be like, okay, well, if you can't be yourself, like I'm going to take a step back from you and you don't get to be in my A group or my B group or my C group. Like maybe you don't get to be in any of my groups, you know, like I <clears throat> expect these things from people it's like I don't know I guess a value of mine I would say but it's I expect genuine connections with people I don't have time to sit in spaces where I can't have any conversation that I feel like having or they can't feel like they can have that conversation and it's okay to have it like it's not a weakness it's not like it doesn't make you poor, like help me, I'm poor. I mean, I like to joke about those things all the time because like that's funny mm-hmm. from the movie, but like I don't genuinely feel that. Like if I ever said to Taylor, like help me, I'm poor, like mocking her, like I think she knows that it's like yeah, not in a level. Like if she said that to me, like I think, I don't know, people really struggle with that if you don't mm-hmm. have that core group of people. Yeah, for sure. I totally agree with that. They would take offense. Like they would take offense to like a lighthearted joke around things like that because they genuinely feel that insecure about it and they don't dare be vulnerable. Yeah, we had, we used to have a friend that we unfortunately had to end the relationship with that she was not authentic and she would act like everything was fine, but in the background be crumbling and only tell like one or two random people. And it wasn't until like Shelby and I sat her down and was like, why are you not telling us things? Like, that's not fair that you tell this random person these things, but you're, you're saying that we're your best friends and we're seeing you as our best friend and you can't tell us anything. And And like, why am I hearing it from this random person mm -hmm. that's not really our friend? Mm -hmm. And like, that was really shitty to have to do. And it made her not be friends with us. And that sucked, but it was like, what's the reasoning on why you can't share this, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) <laughs> well, and I would say too, like that wasn't the first time this happened. It took Taylor no. and I a very, very, very mm-hmm. long time 
before we like actually like confronted the situation and we confronted it not in an ignorant or No, not aggressive at all. way Mm -hmm. like but we like gave opportunity gave opportunity like slip up a couple times but we'd on the back be like what the fuck like why didn't she tell us this this is so weird like what like does she even like care to be our friend trust us as friends like whatever like you go through these whole things of like I thought we were fucking tight and then it just kept happening and so I think that I mean I think there's been plenty of times where Taylor and I realized we waited too long for sure <laughs> um because it's happened more than once with people where the similar things have happened where it starts to just become and that's when like toxic friendships can start to break down but I don't think they have to be toxic like I think it just goes to show like exactly what we're talking about, like be vulnerable and authentic and like find your tribe. And maybe we weren't that person's tribe. Maybe yeah. We weren't. yeah. And like people come in your life for different stages. I believe that 100%. Like I've had plenty of people pop into my life that brought like this glimmer or I learned something different about myself or connected me with somebody else. Like I know you through somebody that I'm not even friends with anymore. Like, mm-hmm. I believe that there's cycles to situations and I've like learned to like accept that. I think it's like when they break toxic and intense that it starts to be like confusing and frustrating and you have to find like the toxic positivity a little bit through it. But I think like with all of this too, you do have to find like your true group of people and accept that not everyone is meant to last forever. I truly yeah, believe that. For sure. For sure. Um, I do want to touch on something that I think will be really helpful. It's about holding space. This has been something that I really had to learn because I am, I love, I still have to learn parts of it. (laughs) I like to try and solve the problem. Like if people not anymore, I still am working on it, but I've, I'm a lot better than I used to be. But when people would come to me, like with problems, I'm like, Hey, like, let's, let's talk about this and let's find a way to fix it. When, actionable steps. Yeah, which everyone <laughs> is not ready for that step. So I'm going to just give a definition of what holding space is. This is a very hot topic right now on like social media. There's a lot of misinformation on social media about holding space. Um, this is a very, very big thing in the therapy world. Um, therapists get trained very in depth on how to hold space for people. Um, So yeah, I would say like, find a lot of information on like TikTok about it, but there's a lot of misinformation about it. So just be careful on where you get information about holding space, but holding space for someone refers to the act of being fully present and emotionally, emotionally available for another person as they experience a challenge or vulnerable moment. It means offering non-judgmental support, allowing the person to express their emotions and thoughts freely without rushing to offer solutions or imposing your own opinions. When you hold space for someone, you're creating a safe environment where they feel heard, seen, and respected. It involves deep listening, empathy, and patience, helping the other person process their feelings on their own terms. I learned this a lot working in the ketamine clinic. I see a lot of people's true selves with no ego, with no boundaries, with no walls holding them back. A lot of times people just want someone to listen. They don't want somebody to offer advice. They don't want somebody to fix it. They want somebody to listen. They want someone to hold their hand while they are listening. And they want somebody to just agree like, yeah, that really sucks. Or I'm really sorry that you are feeling this or your feelings are 100% valid. Not something like, let's try and figure out this. Or what if you approached it this way? Like, Really, sometimes what people and what you need is just to word vomit everything out and just let it be there and just have somebody on the other side and be like, damn, like that really sucks. I'm really sorry that you're going through that. I'm really sorry that that happened. That's kind of what holding space is. So if you have somebody that comes to you and is being authentic and vulnerable, take a beat to like breathe and be like, are they wanting advice here or are they just wanting somebody to listen? And I think that's where I've, messed up with past friendships is like, I'm so quick to be like, okay, let's fix this. Like, what can we do to fix this? What, what are your goals for the future? Like, how can we do this? I didn't take the time to really sit and be like, damn, like that's hard. I totally understand how hard that is. Well, and I think that that's a huge, like, I love this actually like going into our topic because 
I've had to learn plenty of times, especially as an Enneagram one, like we're very like, oh, here's an inefficiency. Here's something that's wrong. Let's fix it. Um, I've had to learn a lot about not jumping in and giving solutions to solve a problem. Um, but what I think is crazier as I like jumped into it, like through my own personal development and through therapy is like, it takes training and growth on your part to be able to hold space for somebody. You can't, you can't just say, I'm going to hold space for you. That's not Mm -hmm. actually physically possible because naturally our own anxieties, our own things kick in, our own opinions, all of these different things come into play and you'll jump right back into let's solve the problem or giving opinions or sharing your own perspective or flipping it and taking it and making it your own problem where like, oh my gosh, yeah, same. I have the same thing. And then that person never feels hurt. And it actually takes conscious development, I would say, to be able to meet somebody and hold space for them. I still struggle with it. I know that Taylor and I, our friendship has struggled with it where like she often would vent to me or I would vent to her and it's immediately like, we're both like, all right, let's fucking fix it. Because we were, we were in a space where we really wanted to fix stuff really quickly. We Mm -hmm. wanted to, I don't know, be done with things that annoyed us, I think. (laughs) And in that time, we never actually held space for our own feelings around those things we were just kind of like solve 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 like life is not a puzzle that's something my (laughs) therapist always would tell me is like it's not a puzzle that you have to solve immediately and it's not something you'll ever solve it's something that you have to accept it for what it is you don't always have to know the why and you don't always have to have a solution and it's something Wally and I have struggled with in our relationship because once he started going to therapy he became able to be more vocal with me and able to talk more about situations. And I had to literally, like Taylor had just mentioned, I had to say, are you coming to me just to vent? Or are you coming to me for us to have an active conversation? Or are you coming to me because you want to solve? And so there was three levels for me because I'm really good at doing all three. I just need to know my fucking assignment. Like I'm a bit of a robot in that aspect where it's like, I need to know what you need from me and I can show up as either one of them. I just needed an, an assignment. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. But it's hard. It's not It's not easy. And I've had friendships where they never held space for me and I didn't hold space for them. I don't take it personally because I don't think any of us had the space to do it at the time. Mm-hmm. But I've learned through losing them and healing and growing that we both had things to grow on. (laughs) Yeah. This is definitely something that is you actively need to work on it Mm -hmm. and something that you will slip up with. Sometimes it was really like working at the ketamine clinic has been a very humbling experience for me to sit in rooms and hear horrible things that have happened in people's lives and just sit there and just like love them and hold their hand and just sit there and let them cry. And I've talked to the providers that I work with a lot, like, how can I do this? Or how can I do this? Or like bounce ideas off of them, which has been so helpful in me learning this. It's definitely a skill to learn how to hold space for somebody. Um, But you also need to know when you are coming to somebody, when you are ready to be vulnerable and open with somebody, you need to know what you're wanting to. Because if Mm -hmm. you go to somebody and they're instantly like fix it mode, and then you get upset and you're like, I'm not asking for that. I'm just wanting to vent. Like, I just want to get my emotions out, my feelings out. I don't need you to fix it for me. But if you don't Mm -hmm. go into that kind of knowing and like, maybe communicating that like, hey, I don't need you to fix this for me or I don't want advice. I just really want to like, word vomit this out feelings yeah like I just need to word vomit this out and I just want to like be done with it like let you know why I'm kind of acting off this last week or something you know I will say too like there's an aspect to this too where you can't always just show up and vent about a situation um and not take actionable steps in your life 100 percent. like yeah there's only so many times that I can hold space for you like there's only so many times I can offer you advice if you continue to show up and every time it's the same conversation over and over again, at that point, that's on you. You're choosing to live this life. And I don't want to hear your bitching and complaining anymore because you're not taking actionable steps to change your life. And it really starts to ruin friendships when that happens because Mm -hmm. people want to put all their, this is another thing that I learned in therapy is people would dump their shit on me and they would keep putting shit in my hands and I kept continuing to hold their shit, which then weighs on me. It Mm -hmm. 
stresses me out. It makes me sad. It, I'm an empath, unfortunately, for myself. And <laughs> it makes me really sad and hard. And I want to just like help solve your problems and make life easier for you. But you have to take those steps. And she was like, why do you keep letting everyone put their shit on you? And why are you holding their shit? Like, it's not yours to hold. Like, stop making it your problem. Stop letting it be something that controls your life or impacts your life. And it really opened my eyes to how many people I have had in my life that would vent and vent and vent, want to solve their problems over and over and over again. It's like this fucking merry-go-round. And sometimes you hold space. Sometimes you offer advice. Sometimes they say, I'm going to do this. And then they don't do it. And then I'm fucking frustrated because you said you were going to... Listen, if you say you're going to do something, you better fucking do it. That's a fact <laughs> for me. And if it happens over and over again, I'm, I can't trust you. I can't trust that you're going to do something like that. So at that point, when you're talking to me, I'm not your tribe at that point, because I don't think you're being authentic. I think you want to bitch and complain, but you don't want to take action. And I'm not here for a bitching and complain session all the time. Sometimes for sure, go for it. But if you don't take action in your life, that's that's someone where like I can't you can't be in my A group probably not even my B group you're probably in my C group maybe in my D I don't know (laughs) depends on the day but that's like a thing that I think is really hard is life is really difficult and it's a lot easier to sit and complain and talk to your friends about a situation and go through life struggling and having really intense hardships and never communicating authentically and not taking action. And it's more common than not that that's what most people will do. Maybe you should have some friends that give you the hard truth of like, okay, enough bitching. And I, I'm not good at that. I won't lie. Like I let people complain and then I just distance myself. (laughs) myself. (laughs) Instead, I should be like, okay, like at this point, you've complained too much to me and I can't hear it anymore because you're not taking steps. Like that would be the healthy thing for me to say. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not there yet, but like Taylor was saying, like, this is something that you have to grow with. You have to keep developing. It's not easy to hold space for people. It's not easy to give them ideas to change their life, but it is worth it to have those types of people in your life. It's worth it to have a tribe that you can talk to and lean on. And it's also even more worth it to ask for help. <laughs> yeah. And I, I do want to touch too, like not only holding space for other people, but what I learned this past weekend, holding space for yourself as well. Like that yeah. is a thing that obviously I struggle with heavily. You noticed that wasn't on my list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like taking the time to hold that space for yourself as well, because you need that as well. Like, hi, my dad died four years ago and I'm oh still God, grieving. Long. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Like I'm, I'm still like, it feels like, like this weekend, it felt like he had just died a week ago. Like that's how raw wow. and real the grief felt. And that shows how much I've been neglecting that space holding for myself. So this is also very important for yourself as well. Yeah. It's equally as important as it is for holding space for others. It's you need to do it for yourself. Yeah. I think, I mean, at the end of the day, like we, we have a lot to say about this topic. Clearly we're very passionate about it. I think when we because... started recording, we thought we wouldn't have anything to say. <laughs> I know, but I do think it's important to talk a little bit about what you said, like holding space for yourself. Like I personally don't do that very often. I find it in different ways. Um, I I know. Um, I find it in different ways. Um, some of that's through working out. Some of that's through like going on a vacation with my girls. Some of it's through like journaling. Um, I could do better. I need to do better. And I think that would make me a more like well-rounded version of myself. I think for now, what I really want to hit home with this is like, be authentic with your group of people, ask for help again, I know I'm guilty as charged, but it's really crucial that like you find the ability to do all of these things for your life. Like it's not easy going through life. And if you can't talk about it, if you can't speak to the people around you, like you're just bottling it up, like, or go find a therapist. Like that's fine too. Talk Mm -hmm. therapy, like go to a therapist. Don't seek therapy through I don't know, what are they called at this point? I feel geriatric. 
No. Yeah. That's a thing. What is it <laughs> like microdosing like through? Oh yeah. Psychedelics. Through, yeah. Through like substance alcohol or yeah. Substance. Yeah. That's what I, see, <laughs> like you know, seek it through these things. Like you need to actually verbalize, like you can't just think them in your head. I'm a head processor. You can't just write them. You have to verbally say things out loud. It's, I don't know like what, what there is to it, but like, once you actually speak something out loud, like it truly changes the feeling, the meaning and how you like interpret it. I would say mm -hmm. I I'm know. an actual licensed therapist yes. because I'm telling you, I'm going to school for this. I always have been the kind of person that's like, uh, college degrees are kind of bullshit. Actually with therapy, it is a big thing because we are specifically trained and educated in how to do these things, how to hold space and how to talk to people and give them actionable ideas, actionable mm -hmm. steps to take. If you are not seeing a licensed therapist, if you're just seeing like a life coach or somebody who just like does like therapy or whatever, that is not going to do any progress for you. It needs to be an actual licensed talk therapist. Well, and I feel like they also have the training to hold space appropriately. Yes. Like there's been plenty of times where I'd be in therapy where I was just like, this bitch said nothing. And I think it's just mm -hmm. because she was letting me speak, which like, I didn't say a ton, but like in my mind, I was in problem solve mode. Like, give me fucking assignments. Give me this. And like later throughout the week, I'd be like, or I'd voice note you immediately after like, damn, in therapy, like you just get these different epiphanies by having somebody that can hold space and not mm -hmm. immediately tell you the problem or the solution. Like- it doesn't always have to be that way. And life coaches are very much that way. Life coaches want mm -hmm. to just be, or energy healers can be the same way where it's like, mm -hmm. well, this is what's happening and here's what you need to do to fix it. They don't mm -hmm. just say, here's what's happening. And yeah. leave it at that. They say, yeah. we're going to fix it mm -hmm. and you need to fix it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so, oh, heavy topic. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to light my little Paulo Santo here. And yeah, well, I think we went way over on time. So I don't even think we need to do our asking for a friend. Yeah. I think we'll save it um, for next time because yeah. I mean, we did talk a lot before we're terrible at keeping time of our episodes, but yeah, I think we're about an hour. So you're welcome, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was intense. So yeah. But anyways, Sorry. thank you for listening. Um, if you guys have anything to say about this episode, if you have any advice, any suggestions, anything, please let us know. If you feel like this episode resonated with you, please share with a friend and yeah. we will talk to you guys next week. Bye. Bye.